Praise the Lord. Yeah, but people, I thought you could really praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. It's a pleasure to be with you at the Bible study today. We notice that, uh, you know, this is the last of all the, as we go through the series, that is, we're coming from Majegunle, Agege, and then we follow alphabetically. And now, Yaba is the last and the greatest. Yeah. Praise the Lord. And you will wonder how this worked out. I think, uh, you know, I think I know that God is in this place in a mighty way. Because this is the last study we're having in the epistle according to St. John. And this is the last district of all the series we're going through. See how everything matched together. You have a place, an important place in the kingdom of God. And that place the Lord has given to you and reserved for you. Nothing will take it from you in Jesus' name. And uh, would you sit down for a moment? I want only all the newcomers to please uh, stand up. I'm so happy we have so many new people here today. It's wonderful. I don't know whether I've ever seen new people like this in any other district church. Yeah, but it's wonderful. And uh, those of us who are coming for the first time, I wish I, at the time I'll come and see you and shake your hands one by one. I really appreciate your being here today. Are you there, newcomer? Shake my hand. Just do like this. God bless you. I do appreciate your coming, and the days will not be your last time. You'll keep coming in Jesus' name. If you keep coming, you are going to hear the announcement of when I will come here for revival. I'm telling you, it's going to be revival. And so, I want you to come, and I want you to invite all your friends. We're going to get a larger place. We're not going to stay in, you know, this is a very good place for Bible study. For revival, something great will happen. You'll be there. Your family will be there. Everyone will be there. Now, everybody, you want to stand up. We're going to pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. We thank you because you brought us to the conclusion of our study in First John. And we pray today that the knowledge of the word will do great in every life in Jesus' name. We're asking, O oh Lord, that you give us spirit of understanding. And also of obedience that will be obedient to your word in Jesus' name. And let the truth have an indelible, unforgettable impact in every one of our lives. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're coming to First John chapter 5. And in First John chapter 5, I'm reading to you from verse 18 all through to verse 21. First John chapter 5, we're reading from verse 18. It says, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God is come. And has given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true. Then he goes on to say, even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. As I read uh, those uh, verses to you, look at verse 18. Look at the way it starts. We know. Look at verse 19. And we know. Look at verse 20. And we know. That word know gives us assurance. And that word is repeated many times in this epistle. Actually, more than 35 times. About 39 times, you'll find we know. Or he knows or we know. And uh, it, it means that it's a book that gives us assurance, assurance of God. 
assurance of Jesus Christ, assurance of the Holy Spirit, assurance of eternal life, assurance of who we are in Christ, assurance of where we're going when we leave this world, assurance all the way through. And that's why it says, we know, and John, the beloved, now concludes the epistle and is going to remind us that we know and is going to bring some essential things, important things, indispensable things, some unforgettable things we ought to keep in mind as it tells us we know and we know and we know tonight as we look at this passage i'm talking on the believers full assurance in christ believers full assurance in christ there's no assurance outside christ and there is no definite knowledge of eternal life outside christ but when you come to christ you repent of your sin you call on the name of the lord jesus christ and you look on him that died for you that gave his life for you that shed his blood for you and then you come in trust and you come in faith and you come believing that this jesus is the only Savior. Savior. There's no other name given among men whereby we can be saved except the name of Jesus. And you know, it's not Jesus and another person or Jesus and another thing. Jesus and Jesus only. He is a Savior. He is a sanctifier. He is a healer. He is a power. And He is a coming King. When you know that, that you know very much. And there's nothing that can shake you out of that conviction. That's what He's saying here that's why john is saying he wants everyone to know you want to know whether you have eternal life or not you want to know whether you have really believed and your faith in christ has actually produced the result he taught to produce that's why he's saying this is an epistle of assurance assurance in christ assurance of eternal life assurance of our life in the look at verse 13 in verse 13 he tells so if this is the key for the epistle itself he says these things have I reaching unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know. You see that? It says, all that I've written to your writing or you're reading from chapter 1 to the very end. You're reading and studying from chapter 1 to the very end. And you've been coming to the Bible study all this time. And he's asking you, do you really know? Are you very sure? And do you understand the key to this epistle? And do you have the assurance that you have eternal life? Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you turned away from your sin? Are you living a new life? Is your life transformed by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ? It says, that's the reason I'm writing this to you. And that's the reason you are reading. And that's the reason you are studying. And it says that we may know that ye have eternal life. And that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. If you have been studying with us from the very beginning, we we'll need to ask you this question. Do you really know? You know who God is? And do you know who Jesus Christ is? Is there a connection between you and the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you have an unshakable assurance in your heart that Jesus Christ has come to your life? Do you understand? And do you know that the Spirit of God be a witness in your heart? And you can say that you know. And you can tell it anywhere. And you can stand firm anywhere that you know that Jesus Christ is your Savior. Jesus is your Redeemer. And Jesus Christ is the link and the key and the door to heaven. And because of that, this assurance is inside you. Look at verse 18 again, what we're studying today. It says, we know that whosoever is born of God. It's telling us there's something we have in assurance. We can be born of God. And Jesus said, except a man be born again, born from above and born anew and born of the spirit he cannot see he cannot taste he cannot enter the kingdom of god and here john wants to give give us assurance he wants to tell us how we really have this assurance some people say you'll have assurance after you die and when you enter into heaven eventually if you're able to enter then you can be sure and they say nobody can be sure today they say who knows tomorrow who knows the future? Who can tell that we come out of sin and we come to salvation and that salvation is real, unshakable, with confidence in our hearts? They say, who can know? And John is telling us, yes, he knew. 
And yes, we know. And as you study this, and you do what it says to do, it says you can have the assurance. That's why it says we know that whosoever is born of God, then it says, sinneth not. Then it says, whosoever, whosoever has got this eternal life, whosoever has got this relationship with the almighty God, there's such an assurance that is begotten of God, and he keepeth himself. The grace comes to him. The life comes to him. And the strength comes to him. And the ability comes to him to keep himself. And that wicked one touches him not. Did you see something there? It says that if you are born again, you are not the one that is running about. Satan is troubling me. Demons are troubling me. That one is troubling me. And therefore, I'm looking for solution. And I'm looking in the valley. I'm looking in the mountain. It says when you are born again, there's an assurance in your heart. And there is a, there's a definite understanding that that wicked one will not touch you. I said the wicked one will not touch you. There will be a barrier. There will be a barricade. There will be a wall, an impenetrable wall between you and the, and the devil that the wicked one touches him not. Unless anybody will forget the key and the reason why this epistle is written. That's why it says in verse 19 again, and we know. And we know. And it says, we know that we are of God. And then it says, the whole world lies in wickedness. It's telling us there, the whole world is divided into two. That is, you have some parts, some people on this part. Those are the people that are sure. They have assurance. And John is saying, thank the Lord. I'm part of that number. I know, and you know, and we come together. And we know that we are of God. Christ links us with God. He gives us reconciliation with God. He wipes all our sins away and he makes us new creatures in Christ and then John says, the people that have the assurance I have and the people that have the experience I have and the people that have tasted of Calvary like I have he says we, we know that we are of God. By the cleansing of our sins we know we are of God and by the change of our lives we know that we are of God and by the sin that Calvary has effected and done in our lives we know that we have got and I said the rest of the world those who have not repented those who have not given their lives to the Lord they might be religious though they might be going to church but they do not have the assurance that they are born again that they are children of God it says that they lie in the wicked one then it says in verse 20 and we know. It's like he uses the word over and over and over. That nobody will go out of this place and they say, we can never tell. We can never know. We can never we can never uh, point to anyone that has assurance of heaven. He said, of course you can. He said you can point at him, John the beloved, because he knew. And then you can point at all the other people that have the evidence in their lives. And they can say that we know. And that's why. He says, and we know that the Son of God is come. He said, I saw him. He spoke with me. I spoke with him. I was his beloved. We edged together. And he said, don't you tell me that Jesus has not come into this world. He said, I know that he came. I know that he came. When they both together, and we walked together, and we went everywhere together, and then we also were on the Mount of Transfiguration together. And he said, we know that the Son of God has come, and he has given us an understanding. He opened their understanding to understand the scriptures and he said I'm one of them and then he said all of us apostles and all of us disciples and all of us members of his church he said he has given us understanding that we may know that's the word again we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true even in his son Jesus Christ and now he wants to tell you what the result of that is this knowledge, not head knowledge, this knowledge, heart knowledge, this knowledge, experiential knowledge, this knowledge, the result of all that, he said, this is the true God 
and it is eternal life. And now he brings his own conclusion. And the conclusion is little children, you're born again, little children, you're members of the family of God, little children, you know the Lord for certainty, little children, you're children of God. And you have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And the Spirit of God is bearing witness in your heart that you are a child of God. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. And once again, Yaba Church says, Amen. Amen. Uh, we're looking at the study today, the believer's full assurance. Not a partial assurance, not a no-so assurance, not a haphazard assurance. Uh, the full assurance of the believer in Christ. Believer's full assurance in Christ. There are three points we're going to deal with as we go to this study tonight. Number one, the character of Christians transformed by grace. Grace. Wonderful grace, grace, marvelous grace, grace that is infinite, that he has given unto us, and that grace comes into our lives and transforms our lives. And then you have the character of such Christians who are transformed by grace. Point number one, the character of Christians transformed by grace. Number two, the confirmation of constant triumph and godliness. There's triumph, there's godliness, and then there's constant triumph that every day of your life, temptations might come, trials might come, difficulties might come, but then you have a confirmation of constant triumph and godliness. Number two there, the confirmation of constant triumph and godliness number three the consequence of consistent trust in god if i trust in god what's the implication of that i hold on to him i look up to him i take him and him alone as my father as the one that does a great creative work and wonders in my life. And I hold on to him without going to idols. And without looking at any other support, any other helper. Because I know he is sufficient and is able in every area of my life. That's why we're talking about the last point. That you keep yourself away from idols. What do you need idols for? When Jesus Christ is your savior. When is your redeemer? When is your healer? When is your helper? What do you need idols for? When Jesus Christ is all in all and the all sufficient one for you. When he is sufficient for you for salvation and for Christian living and for your healing and for your deliverance and for anything you need. Wonder of all wonders you have Jesus Christ and you don't need any other God or any other any idol. The consequence of constant trust in God. Number one, the character of Christians transformed by grace. Point number two, the confirmation of constant triumph and godliness. Point number three, the consequence of consistent trust in God. We're looking at point number one now. Point number one, I come to verse 18. In verse 18, look at what the Lord is telling us here. It says, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Then it goes on to say, but he that is begotten of God, the same thing born of God, begotten of God, he that is begotten of God keepeth himself and that wicked one toucheth him not. We need this assurance because, you know, there are some people that think that uh, going to church is all they need to do. There are people that think that carrying the Bible is all they need to do. There are people that think that joining a denomination is all they need to do. But John is saying there's something more than that. Coming to the church, wonderful. Because it's coming to the church that makes us to pray, that makes us to hear the word of God, that makes us to understand the Bible. But what we understand in the Bible, that's what is important and essential. And then John now is telling us by the Spirit of God, he said, we know that whosoever whosoever is born of God sinneth not. He's saying whosoever because there are people that think that being born again is the doctrine of a particular church. 
of a particular preacher, of a particular minister, of a particular ministry. He says, no, this one is whosoever, whether you are in this church or that other church or that other church, whosoever is born of God, sinneth not. There's some people that think, well, they emphasize holiness and righteous too much in, the, in this place. And because of that emphasis, they say they don't like that emphasis. They want to go to another place. And when they get to that other place, they'll be free from holiness. They'll be free from righteousness. And they'll not be telling them every time that they must be born again. And they must live a righteous life. John says, wherever you go, and wherever you worship, whatever denomination you are attached to, if you have the hope of getting to heaven, it says, whosoever, whosoever is born of God, sinneth not. There's some people that tell us that, you know, when you become so matured and you are high, and you become like an apostle, and then you become like a great prophet, you become like a great theologian, then at that time you'll be free from sin. But look at us, we're just ordinary people. Look at us, we're just uh, young people look at us we just started coming to church and how can we be free from sin it says you we know this that whosoever is born of god you see that word whosoever an apostle that's whosoever a pastor that's whosoever a minister that's whosoever a member of the church that's whosoever a teenager that's whosoever it says this we know there's no shadow of doubt in this one we know if anyone claims to be born again and if anyone is born again in reality whosoever is born of god tell me what follows there sin is not you see that what sin is well, anytime you see that uh, a verb in the King James uh, version of the Bible, and you see the TH, it means he does not sin. It's a continual sin. He wakes up on Monday and says, praise the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. And today, God is greater than Satan. And today, my Savior is greater than the tempter. And today, all the harassment of the devil I'm going to overcome because the one who lives within me is greater than the one in the world and therefore it takes monday as a victorious day and then he comes to tuesday he says praise the lord it's another day he gave me victory yesterday he will give me victory today somebody shout amen, amen. And then you go to the market and you know those market people, those are the people they say they are waiting for you. They say they will do this and do this and do that and jolt you and disorganize you that you'll not remember being born again. Being born again is not what you carry in the head. It's not like clothes that we wear and put off and put on. It is something inside our heart. They cannot shake it away from you. They cannot take it away from you. Because whosoever is born of God, tell me out loud, sin is not. It's a continual sin. It gives you the victory all the time. Temptation comes, it grants you the victory. Trials come, it grants you the victory. Because whosoever, God is not stingy with his grace. He gives the grace to everyone that comes. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. And when that salvation comes, it grants us the victory. That's why it says whosoever is born of God does not commit sin and then he says but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself you know why? It does not like to go into a place where it's going to fall. You see, when you understand what life is, take even your physical life, you understand your physical life, and then there's a danger, there's danger somewhere, and the people are breaking bottles, and they, they're killing themselves, and you, you know your life is precious. You will keep yourself away from that place. You'll not go there. Is that right? Or maybe they say that, you know, there is an accident somewhere, they block the road somewhere, and the people, they are doing this and that, they are routing the thugs uh, on the street. And then you hear that because of your life, because you know your life is precious, you will keep yourself, you will not go there. And then if you know that eternal life is more precious than your physical life, if you know that life in heaven is more precious than life on earth, and you have this precious thing, this precious commodity, you have this eternal life and you are born again and Christ lives on the inside of you and you see temptation somewhere and you say you know that's where they mess up and do other things are you going to go there 
Of course, no. Because you know how precious that eternal life is. That's why it says, and we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but whosoever is begotten of God keepeth himself. And then it says, and that wicked one toucheth him not. It will not touch me. I say it will not touch me. I said it will not touch me. That's why Jesus said, I give unto eternal life. And no man can pluck you out of his hand. Because God is powerful. And Christ is powerful. And as you are keeping yourself away, there will be a blanket of the protection of God around your life. And that wicked one will not touch you in Jesus' name. Is this the first time John is going to tell us that whosoever is born of God does not commit sin? No, not at all. Look at John chapter 3. John chapter 3. I'm reading here from verse 5. John chapter, uh, 1 John chapter 3 verse 5. It says, and we, and ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. He's always telling us, he says, I'm not telling you what you don't know. If you're born again, you know this. You know this by experience. If you're born again, you know this. You know this by the witness of the Spirit of God. If you're born again, you know this. You know this by practice. And then he tells us in this verse 5, he says, and ye know, and ye know, and ye know that he was manifested said to take away our sins and in him is no sin look at verse uh, 6 whosoever abideth in him uh, tell me you abide in him whosoever abideth in him sinneth not you know who are the people that abide in him there are people that take uh, you know their own religion like sunday sunday there are pain. sunday sunday medicine they come in they go out. They come in, they go out. But the people who know what Christianity is and the people who know what salvation is, they come into Christ and they abide in Christ. They come into the word of God and the word of God abides in them. That's why it says, whosoever abides in him, abides in the Savior, abides in the mighty Savior, abides in the mighty Lord, he stays there. And when the rain is falling, he stays there when the sun is shining it stays there when there's no food it stays there and when there's food it stays there when friends are near he abides in christ and when foes are around enemies are there he abides there and he keeps on looking unto jesus the author of and finisher of our faith whosoever abides in him sinneth not then it says whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. What does that mean? Whosoever sinneth, again, is a continual sin. That is, it's an habitual sin. And he doesn't understand. He's always dirty. He's always defiled. He's always sinning. He's always doing nothing. Whosoever is, uh, let, let's, let's make it very clear. Because when we say, whosoever sinneth, many people don't understand. Uh, let, let's use the word, whosoever still is. Still is. That's a sin. Because, you know, he says, I come to church on Sunday. Oh, Lord, I, I'm, 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 I'm so sorry. I am a thief. I am a robber. I am stealing. I've done what I shouldn't have done. I've not done what I should do. And then, God, forgive me. And then he says, praise the Lord. God has forgiven me. He goes out of a church on Sunday. On Monday, he steals again. And then he comes back uh, the following Sunday. God, I've done it again. I'm a thief. I'm a robber. But you know, you will forgive. You're a merciful God. You are a gracious God. You are a loving God. Forgive me. And then he says, I'm forgiving. Then he goes out on Monday again. And what is he doing? He's pilfering and stealing. Whosoever stealeth, stealeth, stealeth. And he keeps on doing it. He says, He has not seen God. Neither does he know God. Pick another thing. Somebody is always, you know, fighting. And you know, something, a little thing sin happens and then he removes his dress and he says today today we're going to fight it out and the fellow is angry and he sees that the other fellow may even have machete or whatever but he's lost his sense because when that anger comes upon him he will do anything and then uh, somebody rescued him before they killed him and then he said oh god if anything like this happens again i will not fight anymore 
And then it comes on Sunday, God, you know what happened last uh, Wednesday? I did this, I did this, forgive me, forgive me. Ah, praise the Lord, he has forgiven me. If we confess our sins, his faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. They say from the head is not in the heart. And then he goes over again, he's coming out of church, and then he enters into the bus. And uh, the bus conductor said, uh, you have not given me money. Me, I've given you money. Check up. It's the other fellow said, no, you have not given me. And then, if you say that again, I will slap you. You slap me. I too, I will slap you. And then they start again, church man, church woman. And they start all over again. Whosoever fighteth, 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 getting angry and angry and angry every time. And there's no release. That one is not born again. That's what he's saying. Now come back to this passage. It says in verse 6, whosoever abideth in him. Thank God I abide in Christ. I said, I abide in Christ. Whosoever abideth in him, sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth, tell me, has not seen him, neither known him, little children. Verse 7, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin, you will tell me. He that committeth sin, tell me. Now, hold on, hold on. It's not sin he that committed in the past. Oh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have all sinned in the sight of God. But we come to God and he forgives us. And then he forgets everything we have done. He's talking about the people every day. That's what they are doing. It's like full-time work. It's like their full-time business. It's like their full-time assignment. They, they're going to sleep. They say, ah, what happened today? I've not uh, seen today. And I cannot sleep except, you know, something must happen today. I've not fought anybody today. I've not gotten angry today. And I've not stolen something today. And, uh, and now we are almost about to sleep. This day is going to pass like that. And I will not do something. Uh, let me, if I cannot do it directly, I'll pick my phone. And then picks his phone. And then calls somebody. And the fellow said, you're yeah, waking me up at this, uh, you know, we hour of the night. And he says, uh, who are you? What is that? And then begins to fight. And after he has fought for that day, then he say, okay, bye, 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 good night. He puts on the point and said, I did a business of today. That's what he's talking. The people that are doing it every day, it, they must not allow a day to pass. They must do it. Those people don't know God. If there's no fight, they're looking for a fight. If there's no anger, they're looking, to, they're looking for somebody to get angry with. If there is nothing to steal, if they see a scrap of paper, they must, it's like compulsive something. It's like their nature. That's what he's talking about. But when we become born again, God sets us free. And thank God I'm free. Somebody there, thank God I'm free. That's why it says, but the people that commit, that commit, that do it traditionally, and they do it repeatedly, and they do it habitually, and that is their lifestyle, and that is their business in life. It says, he that committed sin is of the devil. Hold on now. Maybe sometime you have been born again, you are a child of God, and then this is not your habit. This is not your regular thing, but something just happened. Either you, you were surprised, you were taken, you were taken aback and something happened and you say what you shouldn't have said and you do what you shouldn't have done that's not your habit if you're a child of God that's not the regular thing you do if you're a child of God this one came and how could this happen to me you became sorrowful immediately and you go to Calvary immediately Lord I don't know how this happened this should not happen to me I'm a child of God I'm born again I've not done this kind of sin how long now how could I do this and the Lord forgives you it's not talking about people like that it's talking about people People that make it a habit and they make it something habitual. I'm doing it, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. I pray you'll not be like that. He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. You have seen him. I said, You have seen him. He has knocked at the door of your heart and you have opened the door of your heart. He, before this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. 
For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. And that's new life right there. And I pray that that new life will be yours in Jesus' name. How do we experience this new life? What strengthens us in this new life? That you are born again, you are a child of God, you are washed in the blood of the Lamb, and it gives you victory, constant victory every time. How does that happen? We're looking at Psalm 119. Psalm 119, I'm reading from verse 9. Psalm 119, we're looking at verse 9. It says, Whither, whither, uh, uh, where, whither shall a young man cleanse his way? Young man, you're face the world. Young woman, you face the world. And we older people will face the same thing in the world. Temptations are there in the world. Trials are there in the world. And uh, all these uh, things that will try to jolt you and turn you around and divert you and almost destroy you, they're there in the world. How can we have the victory? How can we live without, you know, going into the errors they go to, into the defilement they go to, into the dead they go to? Look at this. Where were there? Shall a young man, a young woman, a believer cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? Taking heed thereto according to thy word. We learn the word of God and we allow the word of God to transform us and to change us and to do an effective work in our hearts. Look at verse 10 with my whole heart have i sought thee oh let me not wander from thy commandments thy words have i hid in mine heart tell me why that i might not sin against thee the more you study the bible the more you store the bible in your heart the more you read the bible the more you reflect on the bible in your heart and the more you go into the word the more the word goes into you and the more of the word you have in your heart it becomes like you know part of your blood and part of your veins and part of your system and if anything is happening you remember the word of god remember the promise of god you remember the commandments of god and you remember that christ can come at any time that's checking you every time it brings a checks and balances in your life that's why it says in that verse 11 thy word have i hid in mine heart that i might not sin against thee. If you don't hide the word of God in your heart, you'll not remember the word when temptation comes, when trial comes, when difficulties come. You'll just do what other people are doing and you'll be a man of circumstance, a woman of circumstance. These are the circumstances around and then you just follow. But the word of God abides in you and the word of God dwells in you and the word of God is strong and mighty in you. Do you remember what John the Beloved says i read it to you in first john chapter 2 first john chapter 2 those young men and those believers how did they have the victory how did they keep the victory how is it they were so strong and that wicked one will not touch them we're looking at first john chapter 2 first john chapter 2 and i'm reading here from verse 13 it says i write unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning i write unto you young men because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, children, because ye have known the Father. Look at verse 14 now. I write, I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. Here's where we're going. I have written unto you, young men, because, tell me, ye are strong and what? The word of God abideth in you. And ye have overcome the wicked one. When the word of God abides in you, the word of faith and the word of power and the word of salvation and the word of righteousness and the word that keeps you strong and gives you conviction and gives you a great backbone that you know that Christ can come anytime and then you make up your mind, you're like Daniel, he purposed in his heart that will not defile himself with the things that the king had recommended. That's what he's saying 
when that word is in you like that, it will keep you up and it will straighten you out and you will live the victorious life in Jesus' name. In Proverbs, I'm reading from chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4 and we're reading from verse 23. Proverbs chapter 4 and we're reading from verse 23. The place of the watch of God in the life of the believer. What keeps you up? What keeps you strong and what gives you conviction and what makes your backbone, spiritual Christian backbone strong that you are not falling and rising every time. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23. It says, keep thine heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a forward mouth and perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on. And uh, let thine eyelids look straight before thee. You're not diverted by things that want to divert your attention from Christ. You're looking at Christ, the author and the finisher of your faith. Ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil that's how we have the victory and you will have the victory yeah. the devil might try to come and then make you fall but you will stand yeah. because we're told in first john chapter 4 first john chapter 4 and i'm reading here from verse 4 first john chapter 4 verse 4 it says in the first john chapter 4 verse 4 ye of god little children because we are born again ye of god because you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and you are a member of the family of God. Ye of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. But as we we'll read that verse of scripture, internalize it, put it inside you. And who is that person in the world? Think about that in your office, in your community, in your house, in your local church. Who is that in the world outside of you that has the power more than Christ who lives inside you, who can make you fall? Who are you afraid of? That if that person says, do this, you're so afraid of him, you, for, you forget Christ and forget the spirit of God and you forget the power of God that lives in you. If you remember every time I am born again, I'm a child of God. When you were born again, Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, I will come in and sup with him. And when he comes in, he comes in to stay. He comes in to abide. If you have opened the door, of your heart and Christ has entered in whoever is there in the world the tempter whoever is there in the world the persecutor whoever is there in the world whatever they have whatever they don't have and whatever power of Satan they may have the person who lives on the inside of you is the greater one is the mightier one and that one outside cannot defeat the one inside you and cannot make you to fall because greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world that's why i keep on standing that's why i keep on believing and that's why i know i'm going to have victory that's why i know i'm going to overcome temptation because you are born of god and the spirit of god inside you is bearing witness that you are a child of god that's why i know you are going to have the victory and the next time I see you, I'll see that victory on you. You will not fall. You will not go back to sin. You will tell that tempter, that temptress, you've come too late. There's somebody abiding inside me. And because he abides inside me, I will not fall into sin. Give me a good amen. We come to point number two now, the confirmation of constant triumph and godliness. The confirmation already is there, but we need confirmation. The confirmation of the Spirit of God and the confirmation of the Scriptures. The confirmation of the power of God in our lives. We are coming to First John uh, chapter, chapter 5. And I'm reading from verse 19. It says, and we know that we are God and the whole world lies in wickedness. It says we know where 
have God. And the whole world lies in wickedness. This is, we understand that the world in which we are living is a wicked world. It's a terrible world. But we are not hiding inside in our houses in a corner somewhere and say because the world is evil and the world is wicked and the world is violent and the world is terrible, then we cannot go out. We are the one that carries the power and we carry authority with us. And the one who lives in us, by him all things were made. And without him nothing else was made that was in the world. And because we carry him about and he's in our heart, we know that whatever wickedness is in the world, we have overcome already in Jesus' name. Because he that abides in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Then thousand will fall by this side and then another thousand on that side, it will not come near you. Because it's going to give you the victory. You enjoy the victory. You experience the victory. You maintain the victory in your life. That's why it says we know that the whole world lies in wickedness. But we know that we are of God. Look at verse 20 here. It says, and we know that the Son of God is come. We know that the Son of God is come. Well, history, we know that the Son of God is coming to the world. He was born in Bethlehem. And we know that the Son of God is come. He lived in Nazareth. We know the Son of God is come. He performed all those miracles in Capernaum. We know the Son of God is come. We see him at Calvary because he died for us on the cross of Calvary. More than that, we know the Son of God is come because he's living inside my heart. I feel his presence there. I sense his power there. And I know that because he is come, the son of God, that shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And you'll call him Emmanuel, which means, what's Emmanuel? God with us. And we know that he is come. The day you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ went, he passed from history and he passed into your story. And then he came to live in your heart and you can say, I know that the son of God is come. How do you know? He lives inside my heart. He spoke to me today. And when I read the Bible, I don't understand. It's the one that makes me to understand the Bible. If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus Christ dwelleth in you, he will quicken your mortal body and will quicken you in Jesus' name. That's why he says, and we know that the Son of God has come and he has given us and understanding and then it says that we may know we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true even in the son in his son jesus christ this is the true god and this is eternal life everlasting life we know i pray you'll know it we're looking at it we're looking at romans chapter 8 because the spirit of god makes us to know and the spirit of god bears this witness in our heart and it tells us who we are and it tells us what we have and it tells us who lives on the inside of us i'm reading from romans chapter 8 i'm reading from verse 11 it says but if the spirit of him that raised up jesus from the dead dwell where in you he that raised up christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by a spirit that dwelleth where that dwelleth in you you'll have that understanding every time and he says and the son of god himself he has given us the understanding that he the spirit of god dwells in us look at verse 16 the spirit dwelling in us is the one bearing witness in verse 16 the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of god that we are the children of who of God. Look up here for a moment. The Spirit of God bears witness and speaks with a clear voice in your heart that you are a child of God. And then there is a one madman on the side of the road. She doesn't know what he's saying. And that's what he says to everyone. And then he points at you. Hey, you are coming from church. You are our Satan. All you people going to church, you don't have the Spirit of God. You are not born again. You know, madman. And then the Spirit of God says in your heart, you are a child of God, you are born again. And then the madman on the street says, you are not born again, who is right? I said, who is right? 
Uh, you, you know, sometimes uh, there are some religious people, they, they, they read their Bible upside down. They say, you people, proud people, and you are telling us that, you know, you are born again, you do not commit sin. You do not commit sin. Who tells you that? Are you t going to tell us that you have not stepped on an ant? Have you not killed an ant? Have you not killed cockroach? And if you've done that, everybody has sinned. Everybody is a sinner. It says me, I'm a sinner. And you, you are a sinner. God says Jesus dwells in you. And he gives us an understanding that we are born again. And whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. And the spirit of God is bearing witness in your heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Things are different. The things I used to do, I do them no more. I know I'm born again. And that a priest, a church man, is pointing at you saying you are, you are a deceiver. You are a liar. You are not born again. Who is right? I said who is right. I know I'm born again. I said I know I'm born again. Born again, born again, I'm born again. And things are different now. Whoever, whoever says, whoever points to you and says, no, you are not born again, I have a greater testimony inside me. A theologian says, nobody can tell that you are born again. I have a greater testimony inside me. A denominational fellow points at you and says, nobody can say he's born again. Nobody can say he's not committing sin. Everybody is a sinner. I have the spirit of God bearing witness in my heart that I am a child of God and I have the victory and that ignorant fellow will not take my victory away. I about you. I said that ignorant person will not take my victory away. Look at it again. I'm reading to you from uh, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I'm looking at verse 16. It says the spirit beareth witness. We is our spirit that we are the children of God. In verse 17 I need children. Then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. I pray that this victory will be yours in Jesus' name. You see, the victory has given us a look at Paul the Apostle now in 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. If anybody should have doubt about being born again, I think uh, Saul of Tarsus should have doubt. If anybody should have doubt about forgiveness, I think Saul of Tarsus should have doubt. You see, there are people, they do not understand that when God says he forgives, he forgives. And when God says he cleanses you, he cleanses you. And the devil will be bringing, you know, something to your remembrance that God has taken away, that God has forgiven, that now, by the grace of God, that's what you were in the past but you are not like that should they if anybody should be thinking of the past i think saul of tarsus should be thinking of the past that man was terrible but now he came he said i rejoice in the lord because i am born again because i'm new because i've given my soul to the lord and he's able to keep it until that day if saul could say that you will say that and everything you've done in the past, everything is gone. He's put everything in the depths of the sea of God's forgetfulness. And he'll not be remembered against you anymore in Jesus' name. Second Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 12. It says, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. So, I know whom I have believed. Believed an injurious man in the past, I know whom I have believed. A murderer in the past, I know whom I have believed. A person that hated the name of Jesus and hated all the people following after the Lord, he said, But now I know whom I have believed. And then he says, I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Have you committed your life to the Lord? You give your life completely without reservation vision to the Lord and you say I believe Jesus is my savior I believe he died for me on the cross of Calvary that's all Saul did that's all Paul the apostle that's what he did look at this he tells us in that uh, verse 12 he says he is able to keep that which have committed to him against that day if he could say that you will say that your life that you give to the Lord, he'll keep it until that day. And the salvation he has given to you will be kept until that day in Jesus' name. And we're looking at Titus uh, chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. 
And we're reading from verse 11. Titus chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 11. In verse 11 it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. The grace of God does not come empty handed. When the grace of God comes to you, it comes with salvation. It brings salvation into your soul, into your heart, into your life. It says the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. And thank God it appeared unto me. I said it appeared unto me. Then it says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live how? Soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Look up here. In this present world. You know the world around us is a careless world. Why? Why are they careless in the world? They don't know the future. They don't know about hell. They don't know about heaven. They don't know about Calvary. They might treat it as if it's a historical sin. They don't understand about the Christian sin. And therefore, the world is careless. The world is sinful. In fact, when you get to the office, you'll find those men, and then they're talking together, and they're laughing hilariously, and they're saying, you know, I got that lady, I got that thing. What are they talking about? They're talking about immorality, and they're joyful about it. And they're saying, come, 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 let me tell you what happened at the weekend we did this and we did this they think it's a happy thing that's the world and then sometimes uh, somebody goes to the market and he buys uh, something and he gives uh, 500 uh, naira and uh, the fellow going to give uh, the change gave him back uh, 750 because he bought something of uh, 250 and he gave 500 expecting that the person will give him back how much now 250 but the fellow that sold sold the thing thought that he gave him he gave her 1000 and gave a 750 and the fellow saw it and he put it in the market and then when he gets back at home he's saying you know what happened today i slapped that woman I got, I got her. I look at the money I got and look at everything I bought and then I've got extra. That's the world. They don't understand. And we cannot be like them. That's why he's telling us that we have got salvation. And the grace of God that comes to us is teaching us. All those people will not teach you how to steal. I said they will not teach you how to steal. We don't borrow from them, their character, their behavior, their lifestyle, because that's the world. It's a dirty world. It's a, it's a kind of, it's a world that steals and they don't know what they're doing. But we'll come to that world we'll say, praise the Lord. I'm going to the market with my salvation. I'll come back with my salvation. I'm going to the office with my salvation. I'll come back with my salvation. Because the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto me, teaching me that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, I should live, tell me, soberly, and tell me, righteously, and tell me, godly, where? In this present world. You look like a victorious person. And that victory, the Lord will keep it in your life in Jesus' name. And then he tells us now, we're still in Titus chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 13, looking for that blessed hope. And the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from how many iniquities? From all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Zealous of good works. And I pray that that same zeal will be in every one of us in Jesus. Point number one, the character of Christians transformed by grace. Point number two, the confirmation of constant triumph and godliness. Point number three now, the consequence of consistent trust in God. We're coming back to 1 John chapter 5. First John chapter 5, we're looking at verse 21. It says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Why? You ask yourself, why do people worship idols? Because they have problems. And because they don't know the true God. And they don't know Jesus Christ. And they think that that idol will solve their problem. If they are barren, they think that idol will give them children. If they are jobless, they think the idol will give them jobs. 
If they have bad luck in life, what they call bad luck, they think that the idol will remove the bad luck away from them. And because of their ignorance, they're worshiping their idol. But now you have come to know Christ. And you have come to know the Lord. He has become your savior. Not only your savior, he has become your healer. He has become your deliverer. He has become your redeemer. He has become all in all for you. And Jesus now is your message. And Jesus is your trust. And Jesus is the foundation of your life. You have Jesus, you have all things. And if you have that trust in the Lord, constant trust in the Lord, consistent trust in the Lord, and you know that whatever problem you have is going to solve the problem because his promises are yes and amen do you need an idol i said do you need an idol you don't need an idol because all those idols in fact they are useless to start with and because you have jesus christ he, if there's any storm in your life it will it will uh, kind of uh, stop that storm if there's any trouble in your life, he'll take that trouble away. If there's any temptation, he'll overcome that temptation for you. If there's any sickness, he will heal your body. What do you need idol for? That's why John is saying, now that you know that Jesus is all in all. Now that you know that Jesus will solve all your problems. He has already solved some. The problem of sin, he has solved that. The problem of sickness is solving that. The one of suffering is solving that. That's, that's why it says, little children, keep yourselves from idols because that's the consequence of constant trust in god we're looking at uh, first corinthians chapter 10 first corinthians chapter 10 i'm reading from verse 7 you keep yourself from idols why look at this it says neither be ye idolaters as some of them as was some of them as it is rich in the people sat down uh, to eat and to drink and rose up to play it's talking about the children of israel the idols of egypt could not deliver them they had oppression. They had attacks. They had a lot of problems. But uh, Moses came to them, introduced to them, they introduced to them the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the power of that God delivered them from slavery. If they were wise, they would say, see what God has done. What have we got to do with idols? They were by the Red Sea. And then Pharaoh was coming with his chariots. And then they cried to the Lord as Moses prayed. And he opened the Red Sea for them and they passed through. If they were wise, they will know what idols could not do. God had done for them. And then Moses went to the top of the mountain. He went to the Lord to receive the law from the Lord. And before he came back, they said, Aaron, make us gods like Egyptians, so that we may serve those gods. Because for this Moses, we don't know what has happened to him. They were foolish. Or were they wise? They were wise and foolish. And then God told Moses, he said, look at your people. They've gone away. Let me consume them. Let me destroy them. And I'll make of you a greater nation than they are. If it were not for Moses that prayed for them, they would have perished there. That's why it says, neither be ye idolaters. Look at those idolaters of the past and look at how God disinherited them. You don't want to do that. Look at verse, uh, look at, uh, verse 14. In verse 14, it says, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Flee from idolatry. Anything that uh, seems like idolatry, an appearance of idolatry, you flee away from me because you cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve the almighty God and serve uh, Satan and serve idols at the same time. If you go to the side of idol, you go to the side of occultism, and you go to the side of idolatry, you go to the side of all their rituals, then you forsake God. And uh, who will help you more? Can Satan take you to heaven? Can idols take you to heaven? Will idols give you permanent eternal blessing? No. Because, you know, it's only God that can do that. You have this consistent trust in the Lord. And you keep yourself away from idols. Look at verse 19 of that same 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 19. It says, what say I, what say, uh, I then? That the idol is anything or that which is offered to sac in sacrifice to idols is that anything but but I say, verse 20, that, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with 
devils. Look up for a moment. You know, there are sometimes the religious people, they might be in this religion on the other side of the fence. They might be in that other religion in the forest. They might be in that other religion coming from the village. They might be in that other religion they got from the river. They might be in that other religion they got from the woods, but they want to sacrifice. And they sacrifice to the sea, the ocean. They sacrifice to the tree. They sacrifice to iron. They sacrifice to the moon. They sacrifice to the sun. And then they bring part of the sacrifice. And here you are, you are hungry. And they have sacrificed all that. And then they are disputing the food. They say, hey, take it to uh, Michael. And take it to Josephine. And take it to Mama Glory. And, uh, and then they bring the food. And you know the sacrifice. And they said, you know, we just sacrificed to Adam. We are trying to appease our God. I'm a Christian. Should I eat that? Who did they sacrifice it to? The devil. Look at it. Verse 20. Verse 20. He said, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Oh, somebody says, you know, if I don't take it from her, he'll be, she'll be angry. And so that she will not be angry, I will eat what is sacrificed to the devil. I will temporarily, I will link up with the devil. I will accept the devil. I will accept the food of the devil. And then Satan will say, well done, you have eaten my food. I'll meet you in the dream. Don't say you don't belong to me. You have taken that sin. It was sacrificed to me, not to your God. And now you have eaten that. I'll meet you in the dream. And then begins to oppress you. Will you take it because I don't want to offend them? Tell me. Maybe some people there have been taking this sin. And so they cannot answer. I said, will you take the food sacrificed to the devil? No. They might call it this religion, that religion. Whatever religion they call it, we know the truth. And we know the word of God. And you will not be partner or partaker of the devil in Jesus' name. And you will not be defending the people who are, you know, serving the devil and serving all those idols and say, but you know, I about this, I about this, I about that, and all that. We're going to keep clear from everything in Jesus' name. I'm looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm reading verses 9 and 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. It says, Know ye not? And the apostle has been telling us we ought to know. He said, Ye know, and we know. And now Paul, the apostle, is asking us, Know ye not that the righteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? He says, Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor, tell me, idolaters, nor the nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor abusers of themselves, with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. It says they'll not inherit the kingdom of God. You want a plate of a rice that is sacrificed to idol to keep you away from the kingdom of God? Or a plate of a pounded yam or whatever it is, or pepper soup to keep you away from the kingdom of God? Reject that sin and keep Keep your relationship with the Lord and don't have anything to do with the idols of your neighbors and the idols of the land and the Lord will keep you faithful until the very end in Jesus name. And if your parents and, uh, you know, you are taking that, your children are watching you. If Papa can uh, take that, if Mama can take that, then what's wrong with us? Uh, children taking that. And then you introduce your children to idols and uh, to think sacrifice of the devils. I pray you will not in Jesus' name. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 15. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15. I'm reading here from verse 18. Acts, chapter 15. We're reading from verse 18. Known unto God, all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them, which from the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them, that they abstain from the pollutions of idols. Were right unto them. They are born again. They are converted. And God knew that the Gentiles would be converted. These Gentiles who are born again, that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from 
blood. And look at verse uh, 28. In verse 28, it says, For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost. You see, this is not just the idea of man. This is the word of the Lord. And this is the principle, the direction, or the directives and the commandments of the Holy Ghost. It seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater body than these necessary things. This is necessary. It says in verse 29 that she abstain from meats offered to idols. You abstain from meats offered unto idols. And then it goes on to say, and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication from which if you keep yourselves, you shall do well, fear ye well. And I pray that as you keep yourself, you will keep yourself in righteousness and holy and impurity of life and you'll not go to all these idolatrous things in Jesus name uh, there's something we still need to notice about idolatry in the New Testament we're looking at Colossians chapter 3 Colossians chapter 3, I'm reading from verses 5 and 6. Colossians chapter 3, and we're reading here from verses 5 and 6. It says, mortify. That word mortify means put to death, destroy, get rid of this. Modify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. What are they? Fornication. It says, cancel that from your life. Destroy that from your life. Mortify that from your life. And then it says, uncleanness, un unclean language unclean dressing, unclean talk, unclean relationship. It says, mortify that. And then it says, inordinate affection. A kind of love that is inordinate. A kind of love that is improper. A kind of thinking about somebody, a man, a woman, that's improper. It says, cancel that evil concupiscence. And then it says, tell me what follows that. It says what? And then what does it call it? which is idolatry. Covetousness, which is idolatry. Covetousness, which is idolatry. You may not be worshipping an idol of stone, idol of wood, idol of gold, idol of iron, idol of river, idol of tradition, but it says covetousness is idolatry. Why is it idolatry? When you covet something, and your mind is there, it's like, I must have this. If I don't have this, give me this or I die. And if they will not give you, then you will steal. The covetousness will lead into stealing. And it says, you prize that thing so much. You desire that thing so much. You want that thing so much that you can lose your life for that thing. You love that thing more than God. You love that man more than God. Sometimes it's another person's wife. And the word of God says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, thy neighbor's husband. You'll not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. And you desire that thing so much in your heart. It's like you become sick if you don't have that thing. That's idolatry. That's idolatry. You take that thing near your heart. You desire that thing more than God. That's why it says that is idolatry. Come to the Old Testament and come to Ezekiel chapter 14. Ezekiel chapter 14. I'm reading here from verse 6. Ezekiel chapter 14 verse 6. We're talking about idolatry and it says we shall flee from idolatry. Keep yourself away from idolatry. We're looking at Ezekiel chapter 14 verse 6 it says therefore say unto the house of Israel that a door says the Lord repent and turn yourselves away turn yourself from what from idols and all your abominations turn yourselves from idols and from all your abominations so what idol is he talking about uh, read on it says for every one of the house of israel and of the stranger that sojourneth his israel in israel which has separated himself from me and setteth up setteth up where in his heart it's not the wood outside. It's not the stone outside. And there is something that's in your heart. And you set it up in your heart. It may be position in the church. It becomes an idol. Maybe a woman you want to marry. And then you have not prayed. You just say, God, give me that woman. Give me that woman. Give me that woman. If you don't give me that woman, I die. If you don't give me that woman, I backslide. That's an idol. Money. You set it up in your heart. I must have that. I must, I must have that. And you do everything so that you can have. That's an idol. 
or it is you know certificate you forget bible study you forget revival you forget worship you forget heaven i must have such kids so look at so and so we were in the same primary school together and i was brighter than him and brighter than herself and see now she is saying you know hold this okay and tell me i have this i must have this that thing becomes an idol sometimes it's a child i must have a child if i don't have a child i'll go to the mountain if i don't have a child i'll go to the valley if i don't have a child i'll go anywhere i'll do anything we are talking about salvation i'm saying i have it i need a child you're talking about it you know come to bible study and be sanctified be holy i say i need a child the child becomes an idol or maybe you've got the child now and then you're petting the child you're taking care of the child because of the child you cannot leave the child and go and work for god you cannot do anything because this my child my child my child becomes an idol and that's why god said when these children of israel and they hold their idol in their heart and they come to me he says is a stumbling block of their iniquity before their face and they come to a prophet and to inquire of him concerning me i the lord will answer him by myself look at verse 8 and i will set my face against that man the one that has the idol in the heart and he says i will make him a sign and a proverb and i will cut him off will he get to heaven I will cut him off from the midst of my people, and you shall know that I am the Lord. It's telling us, you know, sometimes uh, young people, or maybe not so young people, uh, this marriage, marriage, marriage of a thing becomes, you know, the dream and becomes everything. And once, and you believe the word of God, you go to the village and then you got some, and we say, look at the word of God. Be not unequally yoked together with some believers. They say, Pastor, I've always been listening to you in every area, but this this one, Pastor, I'm sorry. This one, I will not listen. I must have your wife. Look at my age. If I don't have this one, I will leave the church. If you say that I will not marry this unbeliever, to start with, I'm going to marry her. And I will leave the church. Whatever will happen, will happen. Even if you go to hell, whatever will happen, will happen. That's idolatry. And the Lord is telling you, says little children, keep yourself free from idols. I will not allow any idol to take me to hell. I, I'm talking for myself. I said, I will not allow any idol to take me uh, to hell. You know, when people get to hell, hellfire is forever and ever. They'll burn and burn and they will not be consumed. And they'll suffer forever and ever just because of a woman, because of a man, because of money, and because of job, because of anything. God forbid. I said, God forbid. I've taken my life, I've given to the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever God gives me and whatever Jesus gives me, I'll be satisfied. Whatever he does not give me, I'll get the rest when I get to heaven. And because of that, he says, little children, little children, keep yourselves from idols. The Lord will keep you. Because we know that whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. And the seed of God abides in him. And he cannot sin. And he will not sin because he is born of God. I'm talking to people who are born again here tonight. Outside there. Are you there? Are you born again over there? Inside here. Born again people here. Where are they? Why don't you stand up? And you tell the Lord that nothing will take you away from the Lord and nothing will take this conviction away from you. And when temptation comes, when trial comes, you will stand. You are a man of victory and you are a woman of victory. You are more than a conqueror. And this power of Christ will walk in your life. You will not fall in Jesus' name. Jesus died for you. He wants to take you to heaven. Nothing will take that heaven from you.